episode four. Hello, friends, and welcome back to Bible FAQ with Kirk Van. I am Kirk Van Odehem, your host to the podcast that provides brief, thoughtful, biblical answers to your questions. And I want to thank you for listening today, and thank you for all those who have been uh, listening and supporting uh, the former episodes that we have. I'm looking forward to this new episode and the questions that were sent that I'm going to address here today. As always, please do send me your questions about the Bible, about spiritual life, about God, or any related topic, and I'll do my best to address uh, some of those questions on future episodes. also like to invite you to like and follow our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Bible FAQ with Kirk Van. And that seems to be, uh, for now, the most uh, popular way and, and easiest way to access uh, the content for Bible FAQ with Kirk Van. I also do want to point out our website, kirkvan.com, which will give you a lot more information on different options for accessing uh, the podcast, both in audio and video formats. Well, I want to get right to the questions that we have for uh, today's episode. And I'm going to begin with an episode that was sent to me uh, by an individual named Ron. Uh, Ron sent this, uh, submit this question online. And the question is, is the Old Testament needed? Is it imperative for Christians uh, to use it and to study it? Well, my answer is a resounding yes. The Old Testament is incredibly important. Uh, Unfortunately, it does seem that some factions within contemporary Christian circles uh, do seem to be minimizing the importance of the Old Testament and in some cases distancing themselves from it, which which is just incredibly unfortunate in my view. Uh, If understood correctly and put in the proper historical and theological context, the Old Testament is an indispensable tool for our understanding of God and and many timeless principles uh, that God wants to impart to us that are intended for our spiritual growth. Uh, So we are seriously limiting ourselves in the understanding uh, of what God has to say to us uh, if we fail to study the Old Testament. Uh, Now, I understand it can be a bit confusing at times uh, based on some certain statements within the New Testament and particularly the way they are presented and the way the Old Testament is presented in some uh, Christian circles, uh, which is why we need to study it and understand the context uh, of what the New Testament is teaching about the Old Testament. On one hand, we have statements like 2 Corinthians 3 uh, talks about the Old Testament Testament law being the ministry of death and the New Testament, the spirit or the ministry of the spirit that gives life. Uh, In Colossians 2, we have uh, language talking about the Old Testament ordinances being blotted out or in some translations canceled, wiped out or nailed to the cross. And of course, these are true statements, uh, but they have to be understood within the proper historical context and immediate context uh, of the New Testament itself. Uh, we have we have uh, verses like Hebrews eight uh, in in Hebrews eight where it talks about Jesus being the mediator of a new and better covenant and making the old one uh, obsolete. Some verses or some translations state or vanishing away. And so you know it is uh, difficult without the proper understanding uh, to make sense of those scriptures and to come to the conclusion that maybe the Old Testament isn't for us or isn't uh, important. But on the other hand, to counterbalance uh, this, we read, you know, through the book of Acts, how Peter and Paul and Stephen and Philip and James and others, when they gave their speeches and sermons in the book of Acts, of course, they all drew extensively from the Old Testament for their preaching uh, as, as recorded in Acts and, and recorded, you know, by the uh, Paul and the epistle writers of the New Testament. We'll get to how much uh, the Old Testament is quoted here in just a moment in the New Testament. Uh, We have verses like Romans 15 and 4 that talks about the Old Testament being written for our learning, our being New Testament believers, uh, written for us, for our benefit and for our learning. And 1 Corinthians 9 
uh, especially in verses 9 and 10, uh, we have this understanding of the Old Testament being written again for our sakes as the New Testament church, uh, looking uh, written, uh, intended, uh, inspired by God uh, for the benefit not just of the, the individuals who lived at the time, who it talks about and who it's addressed to, but specifically for our benefit in this age of grace. And then, of course, in 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16, uh, so some very powerful verses of Scripture here. And Paul writes, And that from a child thou hast known the holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So Paul is telling his uh, his uh, his fellow colleague here, uh, his son in the gospel, Timothy, that these holy scriptures that he has known for his whole life, obviously talking about what we would call the Old Testament, uh, as the New Testament was still being written and compiled, uh, how they are able to make us wise unto salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, understanding that the Old Testament, if understood correctly, points to Jesus. And then, of course, this this message about the inspiration and the prophet of scripture that's given to us. And so uh, Paul here recognizing that the uh, indispensable uh, good and the indispensable nature uh, of the Old Testament uh, to the church. Second Peter 3 and 2, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it discusses we must be mindful of the words of the holy prophets and the commandments of the apostles. So again, Peter reminding us that uh, in addition to understanding what the apostles are saying or teaching, those uh, individuals who are responsible for instituting uh, the church and, and the New Testament, uh, their words are, are, are indispensable to us, but we must be mindful not to forget the holy prophets, uh, those who, who God used and inspired the Old Testament through, those oracles of the uh, of the Hebrew scriptures. And Romans 3 and 2, again paraphrasing, talking about the Old Testament came down to us uh, through uh, the Jewish people and are called the oracles of God. Uh, one, one, one translation says the very words of God. So of course that's talking about the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. So again, the Old Testament is critically important for Christians. Uh, just like the New Testament, the Old Testament is God's revelation to man. Uh, just like the New Testament, the Old Testament is part of the divinely inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. And Jesus himself, and, and other New Testament writers, of course, but here focus on Jesus himself, confirmed this. And, and he embraced and he confirmed to us uh, the infallible and indispensable nature of the Old Testament. Jesus said in Luke 24, 44, he said unto them, These are the words which I spake to you while I was yet with you. Uh, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then open he their understanding uh, that they might understand the scriptures. So what Jesus was saying here, he's saying, uh, and this is a description of the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew ordering of what we call the Old Testament. Uh, this references to, to, to the Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, uh, basically what Jesus is saying is the, the complete and entire collection of Hebrew scriptures, which we would call, call the Old Testament, they all uh, point to him. They are all concerning him. And so uh, we couldn't understand uh, what the Messiah is for. We couldn't understand why we, why we need salvation had it not been for the inspiration of the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, uh, the Tanakh, as the Jewish people would call it. And so, uh, and again, at the time of, of, of the birth of the church, at the time of the uh, rise of Christianity, the Hebrew scripture was the only scripture that existed. And so, uh, while the New Testament scripture is vitally important, we can't look past the important, we can't minimize the importance of the Old Testament as well. So, as I mentioned, uh, not just Jesus, but the other New Testament, uh, the, the New Testament writers themselves demonstrate how important the Old Testament is. So, out of the 27 books of the New Testament, 22 of them quote the Old Testament directly, quote it, not counting references or allusions uh, uh, to the Old Testament. I'm talking about direct quotation, so only five books don't. And the books that don't directly quote it are the extremely brief one-chapter books like 
and Titus and Philemon and Second John and Third John and Jude. They're just so short they don't uh, take the uh, opportunity to, to do direct quotes because of the brevity uh, of, of the particular epistles and so they, they don't include any direct quotes uh, but yet they do uh, refer to Old Testament in most cases even in those five. At least 29 of the 39 books of the Old Testament are quoted in the New Testament. So a vast majority, it's not just it's focused on one or two important books, uh, but the majority, the plurality of the books of the Old Testament are directly quoted in the New Testament. And most of those uh, that are not re uh, directly quoted uh, are at least referenced. For example, Jonah is not quoted anywhere in the New Testament, but it is mentioned by Jesus. Judges is not uh, doesn't appear to be quoted in the New Testament, but it is referenced in Hebrew. Uh, Ecclesiastes doesn't appear to be directly quoted, but themes of a, a, in Ecclesiastes are parroted by Paul. Uh, Ruth is mentioned in, in Matthew's genealogy, although not directly quoted. And so even those that are not directly quoted, many of them are referenced and, and looked to as authority and for direction and guidance and knowledge and wisdom and understanding for us. So the question then is about the under, proper understanding uh, and the purpose of the Old Testament and the role of the New Testament era. And this is uh, a topic that we can go on and on and on about, but let me just uh, close this question with, uh, with a few uh, thoughts and a few suggestions. Again, uh, the Old Testament is important, uh, but it's important with understanding it in the historical and theological context uh, that is provided for us in the New Testament. So it's not to be considered a complete legal system that binds us as the Jews uh, view, viewed it at the time uh, of Jesus, and still today some do, uh, but rather it is, it is giving us history and background. Uh, it is giving us messianic prophecies, as Jesus himself told us, that they all testify of him, they all point to him, all the writers uh, wrote concerning him. It gives us types and shadows, uh, not just of Jesus and the messianic promises, but of many different things, the last days. Uh, it gives us uh, many great examples of faith and, and character that we should aspire to as people of God. It gives us timeless principles, especially moral principles, uh, some which are universal pr principles that transcend uh, the law. They come before the law and, and continue after the law. The Old Testament tells us about God. It tells us about his nature, about his attributes, so that we can understand him and know him more perfectly. And those are just a few things that we can glean uh, from the writings of the Old Testament that are really indispensable to our knowledge of God and his word and his plan uh, for our lives. And so is the Old Testament important? Should we still uh, use it as a tool? Uh, a resounding yes, absolutely, uh, in every single, uh, in, in, the, in the greatest way imaginable, um, it is indispensable for our uh, growth and development and relationship with the Lord. So thank you, uh, Ron, for the question. I hope uh, that the answer was sufficient in what you were looking for. And so I'll move on uh, with our second question for today. And this question came to us th through Facebook. It was actually given as a comment to one of the uh, posts on Facebook, uh, but it, uh, it is a question. And it says, uh, can you prove that Lucifer is a fallen angel and not just the king of Babylon? So this is an interesting question, and maybe for those who are not familiar with the topic, the question refers to uh, a prophetic word from Isaiah chapter 14, and we'll look at it just in a minute. Uh, but in a nutshell, this passage deals uh, with a well-known depiction of what has traditionally been understood to describe an angel named Lucifer who sinned and was cast out of heaven, and as a result came to be the devil or Satan himself. Uh, others have revisited the passage and come to a conclusion that it's referring only to a human king of Babylon, which is also discussed in the passage and is not referring to an angelic being or the origin uh, of, of Satan or, or the devil at all. So which is it? Are these verses about Lucifer in Isaiah 14 about a fallen angel who became Satan? Or is it only about a human king? Uh, 
Uh, so this is, it might just seem like some, you know, nerdy uh, Bible question <laughs> that, uh, that we shouldn't really care about too much. Uh, but it, it does have uh, import to our understanding of uh, the existence and the nature of evil itself. It has importance to us uh, about uh, the theology of evil and hell and related topics. So it does seem to be a question of some import. So here's the passage that I think, uh, I think uh, Doug is referring to uh, in Isaiah 14. I'm just going to read the, the verses that are most directly uh, applied to this topic. You can read more on for a greater context in Isaiah 14. But verses 12 through 15, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon, upon the mount of congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So is this referring to uh, this, this who's addressed here, Lucifer? Is it referring to the devil, uh, fallen angel? Or is it just referring to a human king, which is mentioned in previous verses? Uh, my, my view is that Isaiah 14 is referencing both a historical human king of Babylon and also the devil, uh, Satan, uh, Lucifer, as he's called here, which literally means shining morning star. So before I explain my reasons why, let's take a step back for just a moment here and look at the issue from a wider perspective. So the relevant passage here in Isaiah 14 seems to share many significant commonalities with another uh, pericope in the Old Testament prophecies, and that's Ezekiel chapter number 28. And I think it's indispensable to, to, to make the parallel here and to understand this, to take a look at this also. So in Ezekiel 28, this section uh, in question is part of a larger motif regarding Ezekiel's prophecies against several kingdoms that existed in that age, all of whom were enemies or rivals to Israel. And I'm not going to go through them all. You can, you can check out the surrounding chapters around Ezekiel 28 for more information on that. Uh, so uh, basically, and I, I won't take the time to read it here because I want to make sure I cover the, the question, uh, but you, you can read it in Isaiah 28. I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit and tell you about it. In the opening 10 verses of Ezekiel 28, uh, there, it's the prophecy against Tyre, which was a, a kingdom north of Israel. Uh, when this prophecy was fulfilled in 572 BC, when Babylon finally captured Tyre after seven years of besieging it. So Ezekiel predicts the downfall of Tyre, and it actually did happen historically. So uh, we see that, that that's a prophecy against the kingdom. And then in verses 11 through 19 in Ezekiel 28, it's called right here a lament over the king of Tyre, where, where the Lord instructs uh, uh, the prophet to lament over the king this, fall, this fallen kingdom. But the language here uh, in verses 11 and 19, uh, it shifts, it seems to take a dramatic shift and indicate a change to, to addressing an evil spirit that animated or influenced or controlled an earthly king. And the reason I say that is because the description here and the points that are made uh, about the king uh, seem to be a description of, of a spiritual being and not a human, uh, a human being, if you will. Uh, because, well, let me just tell you what some of them are. So again, I'm just, I'm paraphrasing here, but these verses in Ezekiel 28, they talk about the subject being addressed here. It's called the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. And then it says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every kind of precious stone covered you. You were the anointed guardian cherub. And of course, cherubs being angelical be beings that stand guard. Uh, we find cherubs guarding Eden in the Old Testament. We find that they flank God's throne. We find that they hover over the Ark of the Covenant. So these are definitely referring to angelic beings. Now, I understand that sometimes the Bible uses literary exaggeration and even taking in that account, however, taken together, this description just seems too impressive, too lofty to be describing any human being, uh, even a king. Uh, even if we, again, if we take into account this strong exaggeration uh, that sometimes uh, is found, especially in prophecies such as this. So it seems clear that the passage has taken a dramatic turn away from the literal kingdom and the literal king 
and is now being used to describe the spiritual force uh, that was behind uh, this king. And, and in that context seems to describe the devil before his fall and the reasons for his fall. And then the passage continues in verses 15 and 19 to, to describe uh, this sin and fall which again, I believe, is not just talking about the sin and fall of a human king, uh, but the force behind that, and even going back to the original sin and, and fall, that being uh, uh, the devil uh, as a fallen angel. It says, you were blameless or perfect in the King James in all your ways until sin was found in you. Again, doesn't sound like that could pertain to a human because no human being is born sinless or perfect. Uh, I, I expelled you from disgrace from the mountain of God and banished you. Your heart became proud because of beauty. For the sake of your splendor, you corrupted your wisdom, so I threw you down to the ground, or some translations say, to the earth. Um, so I'm just, of course, that's not all a direct quote. I'm just hitting the highlights of those verses uh, for the sake of time here. So in other words, I believe what's happening here is it appears that uh, this is describing the downfall uh, uh, of Satan being created an, an, a cherub, a cher, one of the cherubim, as it says in the previous verses. So it appears to be describing uh, Satan uh, in his unfallen state, but he became filled with pride and so impressed with his own beauty and intelligence and power and position that he began to desire for himself the honor and the glory that belongs to God alone. In other words, this is describing the sin of self-generated pride, uh, which originated in the free will uh, of this uh, previously angel, now fallen angel, which is the devil. So he was judged and punished and banished because of it. He was cast out of the, God's holy mountain, it says. In other words, the realm where God dwells and down to the earth. So, um, and, and many other things we could talk about there. Uh, so this verse of scripture is even more powerful than Isaiah 14 in describing something that doesn't seem could be possibly describing a human king alone. Now let's shift our attention back to Isaiah 14. So if we at least Consider the possibility that Ezekiel 28 is going beyond talking about a human king and talking about the evil spirit that is influencing and perhaps even to an extent controlling the evil king. Uh, then I think Isaiah 14 doesn't seem so much of a leap when we understand that it is the same type of context. So very similar to the chapter in Ezekiel. Uh, this uh, portion of scripture in Isaiah 14 is talking about judgment to the kingdoms. These prophecies are predictions about judgment to the kingdoms or nations that existed. And again, you can read the surrounding chapters and, and look at the uh, subtitles there that are provided for us about all the different nations that are being prophesied against. But then we get to Isaiah 13 and it predicts Babylon's judgment and collapse. And then we get to Isaiah 14, and it predicts the restoration of Israel to its homeland. Um, and understanding historically, uh, Israel was in captivity to the Babylonians. So it's predicting that Babylon will fall. It's predicting that Israel will be able to return to its homeland, which did, of course, happen uh, in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, what have you, Zerubbabel. And then, uh, so this is part of the... Uh, in this part of the narrative then where it is prophesying and predicting Israel's return to their land uh, it contains a, a kind of almost like a taunting or mocking of Israel to the king of to the king of Babylon uh, to Babylon itself but to the king especially and so it seems that though the kingdom and the nation that had formerly destroyed Israel is now itself being destroyed and so Israel is calling it out on this in, in kind of a you know a metaphorical sense a uh, uh, in a prophetic sense, not not literally did this happen, but this they uh, the prophecy is that Israel would have every right to do so, and so in in uh, verses four through eleven of Isaiah fourteen, uh, this taunting, this mocking, if you will, is directed at the king of Babylon. And again, I think in the historical context, we can understand this to be the literal the human king of Babylon. But then, similar to what we saw in Ezekiel's prophecy about the king of Tyre. Uh, as we move forward in the in the verse, it seems that the attention shifts away from the earthly king of Babylon and then begins to take a significant shift 
Uh, so like maybe verses 4 through 11 are talking directly about the earthly king and the earthly kingdom. But then we see another shift in the language. We see it begin to describe something a little bit different in verses 12 through 17. It seems to indicate a change to addressing the king himself to, like Ezekiel 28, addressing the evil spirit that influenced or controlled the earthly king. So again, this seems to be a description of the devil, his sin, and his fall from heaven. He's called the shining morning star, uh, which is Halel in, 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 uh, in uh, Hebrew. Uh, some English translations translate it Lucifer, which, by the way, is somewhat of a uh, debated and controversial translation, uh, but there, but that's how most of us are familiar uh, with that translation. Uh, it says, you know, how are you fallen from the heavens, destroyer of the nation? You've been cut down to the ground. Some translations say you've been crushed to the earth, again, just like Ezekiel 28. And then you have these famous uh, five I wills. I will ascend up to the heavens. I will sit, uh, I will set up my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the mount of God's assembly. I will ascend above the highest clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Now, I suppose in some ways that could be kind of a, you know, uh, hyperbole of describing the king and his attentions and, and, and uh, desires to achieve greatness. Uh, but it seems, especially in light of Ezekiel 28, seems to be describing the same thing. And when we pair and parallel the two together, it doesn't seem possible that it could be describing a human being, but, des but describing a spiritual being, uh, which, it, which Ezekiel identifies as a cherub, uh, an angelic being. And so it goes on to talk about the judgment and the punishment. You will be brought down to Shoal in the midst of the deepest regions of the pit. Again, taken together, these elements go beyond the description of any human human ruler. So it is true that it is uh, directly addressing the king and kingdom of Tyre in, in the instance of Ezekiel 28, of Babylon in the instance of Isaiah 14. So that part is true. That's historically accurate and it was fulfilled, but it seems to be going further and going into a more uh, descriptive, uh, uh, going into the spirit realm and describing the evil spirit, aka Satan, the devil, Lucifer. And so I believe it's doing both, um, and often when we have a dual uh, reference like this, it's called a dual fulfillment or a double reference. It can be describing more than one thing. So is this interpretation correct? Um, has it gone too far away from the text to say that this is actually describing uh, 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 the spiritual being and, and the, the, the original sin and downfall and punishment of the devil himself? Well. I don't think it has gone too far. I think that that is most likely the best uh, interpretation that we can uh, draw from it. And I have several reasons. I'm going to try to go through them quickly here uh, so I won't take too much time in the remainder of this podcast. Uh, but l let me just go through them quickly. Num one reason, the first reason is that these two passages of Scripture inform and support one another. It may be difficult to see what's going on in Isaiah 14 without the clarity of Ezekiel 28, but that's why Scripture in interprets Scripture, and they seem to be parallel uh, accounts in many ways in describing the same incident. So if we didn't have Ezekiel 28, then it might be more uh, a little bit more sketchy, but it seems that this, since we do have this precedent, it sheds light on the meaning of Isaiah 14. Secondly, dual fulfillments of appear frequently in prophecy. So this wouldn't just be some rare, uh, weird deal that we have to conjure up in order to support uh, you know, this hypothesis. For example, even elsewhere in the book of Isaiah, for example, chapter 7 and 9 refer uh, to both heirs of earthly kingdoms, but are also clearly prophecies of Jesus Christ and, some, and even mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, we have Peter's sermon in Acts that informs us that prophecies in the Psalms were fulfilled both uh, literally, uh, immediately by the earthly King David and also in the offspring of David, which is Jesus Christ. So they had dual fulfillment. Uh, predictions of many of the ancient prophets uh, were fulfilled in the ancient times by the ancient kingdoms. And these verses in and around Isaiah 14 and 28 are proof of that. Those all predictions all came to pass. But in these, in these prophets and, and others also, for example, in Daniel, 
uh, we see that they will also be fulfilled by the end time kingdom. So they have a historical fulfillment from our perspective uh, and a future fulfillment, which, uh, which is clear in scripture. For example, Isaiah talks about Babylon the Great has fallen and Babylon the Great did fall uh, back in the ancient times. But the book of Revelation, which talks about future times, mimics and quotes the prophet Isaiah of Babylon the Great has fallen. And so that's just to name a few of the dual fulfillments. So we have that. Thirdly, Daniel's vision of the book uh, in the book of Daniel confirms that princes, as they are called in there, were actually angelic powers that wielded influence and power and authority over kings and kingdoms. Daniel refers to the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece, which is we understand and, and, and make sense of what he's writing about in Daniel 10, refers to ear, evil, spiritual, angelic entities. It even talks about Michael, who we know to be an archangel of God that comes to Daniel's aid in his vision uh, and, and is seen as a prince over Israel in the spiritual realm. So this seems abundantly clear in Daniel that this is pointing to uh, evil spirits, angels and fallen angels uh, that influence and have power and authority over kingdoms and kings. So it's reasonable to apply that same understanding to the other prophets such as Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. The New Testament also substantiates, this is my fourth point, uh, the idea that earthly powers are influenced by the spiritual world. We see this in, uh, in Ephesians chapter number 2. They're talking about the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit working in disobedient. In Ephesians 6 chapter, talks about standing against wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. And so again, it's not a, a, a weird interpretation to understand Paul is talking about many of the struggles we have in this world, political struggles and what have you, uh, are actually being influenced by uh, higher powers, by, by dark forces, and, uh, and, and of course stood against by the, by the powers of God himself. And so the, the fifth reason then is that the subject here addressed in Ezekiel 28 uh, is an anointed cherub, an angelic being. The Bible elsewhere, elsewhere confirms that devil is Satan is an angelic being, even although albeit rather a fallen one. So in Job 1 and 6, we see Satan appearing before God uh, with what's referred to as the sons of gods, which appears to be a reference to angels in this case. Jesus refers to in Matthew 25, the devil and his angels. Angels. So we understand that the devil is a fallen angel from that. Revelations 12 talks about an end time war in heaven in which Michael, the archangel, and his angels fought against the dragon, which is Satan, and his angels. So again, this idea uh, that the, the devil is an angel, uh, a fallen angel, uh, is substantiated throughout Scripture, New Testament and Old. So this understanding clearly identifies uh, with that premise in Scripture. Another reason, the sixth reason, both portrayals of these kings in Isaiah and Ezekiel seeming, uh, provide seemingly supernatural details do not, that do not seem to fit the realistic description of human and earthly kings. And I've talked about that already, so I'll just briefly uh, uh, review it. It talks about different non-human nature, anointed cherub, bright shining star, uh, angelic beings. It talks about a different realm than man, the mountain of God, the congregation of the assembly of the heavenly host. It talks about a different judgment that man received, cast down to earth, crushed down to earth, among many other things that we already mentioned. And so it does not appear to be speaking about attributes that can be obtained by human beings. Uh, just a couple more here. Also, the seventh point, the punishment or the judgment of being cast out of heaven and down to earth uh, if we interpret Ezekiel and Isaiah to be saying that, parallels New Testament statements about the devil's fall. Luke 10 and 18, Jesus said unto them, I beheld Satan, and Satan as lightning fall from heaven. If Jesus wasn't referring to these passages in Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel Isaiah and Ezekiel, then we have absolutely no in insight into what he's referring to. But it se certainly seems to parallel the, those uh, passages. In 2 Peter 2 and 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but did cast them down to hell, and delivered them in chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So again, it's this understanding uh, that it was fallen angels that were cast out of heaven. Again, if, if Peter wasn't referring to these passages in the Old Testament, uh, then he had 
you know, fresh revelation that is nowhere else referred to because that's the only stories that we have in the Bible that refer to that. And other passages as well. Number eight, the, the sin uh, of the subject of Lucifer here in, uh, in Isaiah 14 and the parallel in Ezekiel 28 is self-generated pride. That seems clear from the description in both accounts. This is congruent with New Testament references to the devil that talk about his pride. Again, if Paul wasn't referring to these, the pride uh, 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 of the devil that was inherent to his fall, if he wasn't rever referring to Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, uh, then we have no idea what he was referring to. Uh, he tells us that the judgment, the punishment, or the condemnation of the devil was due to his pride. Uh, and then the, the, fi the final point that I'll make here is the shifting focus from a human being uh, to the spirit behind the human being has another important example in scripture. So you might say, well, it seems odd that you know, you'd know be addressing a human king and all of a sudden start addressing a spirit behind the king. Uh, but remember reading in Matthew chapter number 16, uh, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. Because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Now, I know by itself this is not a very persuasive uh, uh, point, but taking into the whole account of all the other points I made is just one more uh, piece of evidence that seems to uh, uh, substantiate that this is, uh, you know, something, a theme in Scripture uh, that we can draw upon. So, in summary, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 definitely refer to human kings. Of Tyre and Babylon. I don't dispute that. That's not in question. That seems clear in the context of those books and those chapters. But they also seem to be double references or dual, uh, dual prophecies, if you will, uh, dual fulfillment that refer to the evil spirit of the devil that was at work influencing and controlling those evil kings. And as such, those passages give us insight into the origin and the fall of the devil. And so I hope that uh, helps a little bit to, to explain uh, why I do think that Lucifer in, in, in Isaiah 14 and the anointed cherub in Ezekiel 28 is referring both to human kings and the devil. Well, I've done it again. I've gone a little longer than I anticipated, uh, but I'm not going to record this whole thing again. So we'll just have to go a little long today. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, I appreciate all of you that take time uh, to listen to my podcast. So until next time, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Thank you again for listening. Goodbye for now.